number of zero is valuable. So, and uh, also to all the other faculty members and other students and other delegates. Uh, as I understand this uh, workshop, the main aim is to inform uh, about recent developments. And in some areas that are relevant for the clinical, theoretical and clinical uh, skills. I will, uh, to make my talk more relevant, I would like to speak a little bit about my own research. What do I do? How I think that can be informative to what you do. I am a basic uh, science, science researcher and my interest is to study the human mind and its various things uh, with regard to the uh, connection with the human brain and heart. So as a cognitive scientist, I set out to study uh, various things connected to cognition and I, I hope that you have some idea of what, what I mean by cognition. Uh, who has cognition? We know all of us, we have cognition but we are not sure whether other creatures or other extraterrestrial and other you know, we have some doubts. But we definitely are sure we have cognition. So what is cognition? Unless we have some here more something, then we cannot link all, all these systems, attention, memory, perception, vision, and cognition. So I will try to tell a little bit about my work. So I will try to understand what is it, what makes us, what uh, helps us wake up, take these decisions, that I took the decision to come here. Perceive the world, judge the world, ask comments, and wait for the next one. So we are judgmental animals, and we use our cognition, and we feel satisfied when things go the way we want. Now these things do not arise so simply, because they do not arise in everybody. We see failures in these very simple things, lack of decision making, lack of attention, lack of memory. Not saying that there are uh, problems in the brain. I'm not talking about the tissue damage. I'm talking about normal human brains. But we see all these deficiencies on a daily basis. And we know, we can point out, look, he has some issue. Look, she has some problem. So, you know, we keep saying that. That means we have some kind of inept ideas about what is optimal cognition and what is suboptimal or what is deficient cognition. So these are the various things that bother us. And I think one of the main aims of helping people in intellectual areas is to bring them, bring up their cognition or to help them with their division. And most of the time we can only talk about the brain and neurologists and neuroscientists have an excellent idea about the brain and other people that do not talk about the tissue, they talk about the behavior. Now what do I do? I do both. I try to understand some of the things that makes us excellent decision makers attend to things, remember things. But my question is not more about making them, uh, you know, some superhuman or something, but try to understand what these things are, how they develop, how they mature, and how they <laughs> distort over time. Because with aging and various other things, they <clears throat> change over time. Like anything changes over time. You paint a house, after, after one year you see the color has faded. So human brain <laughs> develops, changes, gets into new capacities. So all these things are part and parcel of this. So I try to understand some of these things and I use approaches that are well established in disciplines like cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology is a core discipline of cognitive science. Cognitive neuroscience, the discipline that studies functioning of the human brain, normal human brain, when the brain engages in some cognitive task. And what do I mean by cognitive task? I guess all of you know Responding to stimuli in a decisive manner is my understanding of it all. Willfully, volitionally, and in a decisive manner. And this is the hallmark of human cognition. If this would not be the case, you would not see all these rockets perfectly flying over trajectories and arriving at their decisions, but they themselves are nothing. It flows from this kind of decisive action, volitional action. So I try to study these various things using simple tasks and all of you know what is the definition of a task. So the approaches that I have been using for a long time are from cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology. And there are many, many other theoretical disciplines that also have contributed, not just cognitive psychology and neuroscience, like linguistics, philosophy of mind, 
First, you need to understand my first question that I asked who has cognition? Let's not talk about optimum cognition. Let's not talk about dysfunction. Let's first understand who has cognition. Suppose you create a brain that is just alike like your, yours and mine. Same number of neurons. Arrange them in the same manner. Put something so that they kind of behave as if they are reacting to stimuli. Will it have cognition? Will it have this volitional decision action to stimuli? Will it have the ability to judge good and bad? Will it know or remember what it did yesterday? Computers don't remember. Don't be confused. A computer's memory is not like our memory. A computer retrieves like a mechanical hand retrieves a book from a library itself without having any idea what the book is all about. A computer lacks semantics. It has syntax, but we have both semantics and syntax. So cognitive science is a vast territory where a lot of professionals from various backgrounds they come in, join hands and study using methods from neuroscience, cognitive psychology, decision sciences. They use various models, both human models, animal models, artificial computational models. They study both normal brains and diseased brains. There is no end to it. And this is not done by a single person. This is a collaborative enterprise. <clears throat> Speech and hearing professionals contribute in a big way to understanding, to understand the basic uh, issues connected to uh, 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 cognition. So I have been finding myself doing research largely to an extent on language, language processing, but also on attention and memory and vision. Because I realized that unless until I understand or we understand the basic cognitive systems that make us who we are, understanding how we use language in a particular context is not going to be easy. Because why it is not going to be easy? Because it's, it seems so obvious and natural. Anything that seems obvious and natural is a difficult thing to understand. Anybody can wake up and speak because it is so obvious and natural. It is unconscious. He cannot explain why he used a sentence and not another one. It's only a linguist who will describe it. But that is something else. But he cannot have explicit knowledge. He cannot tell why a certain expression was used and why not another. So because it is so obvious and natural, we need to look what are the systems that are making this so obvious and natural. So you need to look at other systems, the support systems. But it would be wrong to say that attention and memory are supporting systems, unlike <coughs> supporting staff to this main language faculty. That is not the view that I would take today. All of them are equally important and it is a matter of time when one of them fails. So cognitive science, as a cognitive scientist, I have been engaging myself to look at language processing, not just in itself, but with regard to these various processes like attention and memory, and also visual perceptual processes. I do not know how many of you consider this interdisciplinary approach to rehabilitation important. That is the point that I would like to carry. So that the multidisciplinary approach, not only to the study of cognition and mind, but rehabilitation, which is one of your main goals, to rehabilitate someone who suffers, who has a deficit, who has maybe a different orientation. So this multi, that is why I find a connection. Because I do such things and I am quite sure you would appreciate it. So a patient comes in, he receives a diagnosis and you find out various things. You give a water rating test, you administer a certain batteries and you measure against the norm and you say establish that this person has this problem. But the thing is that, have you checked the attention? Have you checked the memory? Have you checked the visual perceptual abilities? I will give some actual examples from research later but I am trying to set the tone. So the first point that I am trying to establish is Cognitive science, because it is multidisciplinary, so the view of the mind today is multidisciplinary. No single person with expertise in a particular field, the pins that I told or talked about, can come and say that I understand the mind and I can treat someone. He has to talk about various other things that constitute the operations that he is trying to define. I am not referring to language or visual perceptual skills or something, or locomotion, or I am talking more generally about cognitive. So, one must have a very broad, integrative <coughs> approach 
to uh, theoretical questions as well as to questions dealing with practical uh, techniques what to do to someone uh, empowered by this knowledge that is the basic uh, thing so now coming to uh, the, the, the top part of it I was trying to uh, uh, I was trying to think while I'm coming here what should I say this is such a vast area and I just cannot really do justice if I start getting into all kinds of things but let me try to uh, build up into three sub things first I would speak something about attention and memory themselves because a lot of what over this period of time a century or so has revealed various fascinating aspects of these systems and then secondly I will go into some concerns uh, that language, speech language pathologists have and how have they been the dealing with these things and what are the theoretical debates and uh, finally I would uh, give some examples from some disorders like uh, specific language impairment, dyslexia and aphasia that I am familiar with and I have the opportunity to work in a speech in the All India Institute of Speech and Hearing as a, as a young lecturer a long time back but so, so I have some opportunity to learn first hand what, what this whole cycle is from theory to application so I, I can uh, go back to uh, memory learning but anyway so this is the, uh, the, the, the track I would follow so let's talk about attention and memory uh, please uh, intervene or please uh, ask me a question or suggest or comment if you uh, have a question or something so what is attention and what is memory I guess all of you may know, if you have read any book of psychology or if you have had a chance uh, to read something on cognitive psychology, you know, attention and memory, everybody knows. These are intuitive things. What is memory? The thing that helps me to remember. Where is memory in the brain? Hippocampus. Oh, we have not checked the hippocampus of humans. We are talking just the uh, findings from mice and rats. But, but memory is something that we all use all the time. And if you don't remember that you are in a bad situation then next day, and memory has been divided into several storages. All right, in the 60s, when cognitive psychology came up as a discipline, and people wanted to do modeling of human cognitive systems, the first attack was on memory. And the model of Schifrin, uh, if you check, is a very classic imagination on a continuum of time about memory. First, you have short term memory, uh, you have long term memory. So, the visualization of memory was that something that you store for a while, and if it is important for your goal, <coughs> if it is important for your life, it is remembered <coughs> eternally. And the long term memory was further divided into autobiographical, episodic, so on and so forth. So this visualization helped for a while because many presents came out. HM, where one was okay, the other was, the other one was gone. So what was theoretically most interesting in that approach was that it divided memory into certain zones, and the, these zones apparently were timed very well, short-term memory for this time and long-term memory later on. But nobody was quite sure. Why should even be remember? Why should even something be remembered? Because it's a headache, it's a hassle. Like imagine today you have online books. Now who cares about buying books in a library, traditional library? So why memory storage is even important? What good does it do? This question wasn't asked. Because that was the initial page of cognitive psychology. And people are more worried about definition. Alright? However, this led to a very influential framework and later on it also opened up other ways for other people to come in. For example, the work by Badley on working memory, all of you know. But most often what is missed about Badley is that the way he talks about working memory as a dynamic system. The dynamicity of, of his conceptualization is overlooked. What is often used is the sketch pads that he talks about for various kinds of things auditory, spoken, and visual. I would try to emphasize on this dynamicity of working memory, and today various experiments are showing that working memory is something that helps a person to compute 
stimuli and act on it. First point. So if a person has no volitional will to act on the stimuli, he has no need for working memory. Volitional will. I need to do this, therefore I need to remember this information as I walk through the step steps. This is two phone numbers. So if I would not have the volitional desire for later action, I do not need to use working memory. That's the important point here. So it is false to assume that everybody has working memory or should have working memory. So what then is to be understood is that unless until current goals are clear to the agent that these goals need to be executed by me, whether by somebody's command or by, by me, myself, then the usability of working memory becomes very evident and brain starts to work on it. Now this conclusion was not given by Badley when he came up with the basic model, but it is now we learn that when you give an explicit task to a participant to perform as his own goal because sometimes in a psychological task the greatest difficulty arises when a participant asks why should I do this that means he is not sure that whether the action that he needs to perform the numbers that he needs to remember the thoughts that he needs to find are his own goal or it is a goal given by somebody else the moment this confusion arises optimal utility of working memory is very less and this is from research findings. So the question arises, are we giving solid goals to them or do, are they realizing that, they, that these are the goals that they need to perform for their own sake so that the use of working memory as a dynamic computational system becomes apparent, otherwise it is not. Information that is acted upon in such a manner where goals have to be executed for reward because we never act in the real world without reward. Then it has deformity because such information will not never go to long term memory. That's why people don't remember. Because there was no motivation, there was no goal, there was unclear goal, it was somebody's goal. He just was told to do so and that was that for a moment. Therefore he never utilized the working memory to an extent that would have benefited the maintenance of information for a long period of time. I think some of these things have, have been uncovered recently, mostly through cognitive psychological tasks and also through brain imaging. And it is not just behavioral observations that have concluded these kinds of things, but also looking at the brain as people do these tasks under various task instructions. They have to choose the task freely. Would you want to do this or would you want to do that? I often, use, I often use variations of this task. Now I am telling something that I do not think has yet been in the textbooks. The free choice task, where they choose the task freely. Would you want to name the animal or would you want to name its color? So they choose freely. And you see a very dynamic interaction or effect of memory and attention in such free choice tasks. So the point that I am trying to uh, make is that unless the task sets the goals the motivation, the reward uh, associated with the goal, the action that the agent himself understands well, the mechanics are clear. None of these things are going to work out because his brain just will not activate the neural networks. The neural network will not be activated because the goals are not clear. So the usability of working memory as a computational hub that integrates information dynamically because what, what do I mean by integrates information dynamically? The classic task of remembering a phone number. Now many people would say, okay, you cut it down into three, three digits and remember, but we just don't remember uh, phone numbers uh, as numbers. We also remember, uh, if it is a digit, we remember font. We remember where it was. <coughs> so, uh, so all these kinds of things. So Badler's working memory was a very good conceptualization that alerted researchers about the dynamicity, dynamicity of cognition that is linked to goals, motivations, desires, and finally action. This is something that is not really readily available in regular discussions on working memory because most students or most other people, they just view working memory as a classic model that kind of <coughs> takes in two types of information and stores it for a while and then it goes out 
that is the view most people but i am offering a view which is actively using working memory for satisfaction of one wants current goals so what is most important for anyone is to understand what are the current goals of this agent unless and this is this, then we come into the territory of motivational psychology and all other things but i think this makes sense unless and till the goals the tasks that you are apparently giving the person is clear to himself as his own tasks then the recruitment of such cognitive systems <coughs> understanding about them becomes easier otherwise they are very difficult so this is the uh, uh, this is this is how memory research has progressed and lot of modern uh, 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 neuroscientific evidences are thrown up about diseases of memory. I am not going into the diseases of memory, and also know that if there is a cortical insult, if there is some kind of tissue damage, either because of a degenerative neurodegenerative disease or because of a developmental pathology, some form of memory lapse is going to occur. So all of you <coughs> must be aware of various types of conditions and the classifications and their corresponding uh, deficits in, on various memory tasks. I am not getting into that. With regard to uh, attention, so so the 60 years of research uh, to, to, to capture in a nutshell, first there was this conceptualization of memory of distinct phases, uh, short term and long term, and then for the divisions into this and that, because that, that went well with the with that prevailing scenario in psychology and other disciplines. But later on, when people started to understand themselves, their cognition, their mental abilities, and all these goals and uh, agent food and what I consider a task and what is not a task and why should I remember this information for how long it is important for me all this became very clearer so conceptualizations have changed over a period of time and I am quite sure if you look at research articles in journals like speech uh, you know JSL, HR and American Journal of Speech Language uh, Pathology you will find that of, of, of 70 80 percent of uh, articles are not merely classificatory they are not classifying or they are not diagnostically oriented. They are talking about basic components of cognition and they are trying to also link uh, theoretically uh, how these things are influencing what you observe as an outcome or a, uh, or a behavior or in some way. So things have changed uh, in the last uh, 8 to 10 years because of this rapid advancement in theoretical conceptualization in fields like cognitive psychology and experimental psychology and other human sciences and also in neurosciences, both cognitive neurosciences and other branches of neurosciences and also massive development in our ability to computationally simulate certain incidents or certain pattern of data or certain behavior and to learn more about them. With regard to attention, it is like William James said, it is something that all of us know, what is it, but nobody can define it. And that actually remains the same even today. The best of the attention researchers would not be able to define what it is, but they would like to describe, it does this to me. Why it is so massively difficult to define attention? Just because it is not a unitary process. Like memory is not a unitary process, it is a combination of several other processes and this view is an outcome of research in the last 50 to 60 years. Research on cognitive psychological research on, on attention began around the same time as it began on memory in the 60s in, during the cognitive revolution itself. The, the most, uh, 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 I don't know how many of you are aware of the historical development on research on attention with empirical techniques. Uh, the first uh, important model was given by Donald Broadbent, the British uh, cognitive psychologist. And Broadbent used a, a, a simple definition. He, uh, his question was uh, how to first define attention. So I, I, according to Broadbent, and which remains still the classic definition of attention, is the process that allows us to selectively to attend to some stimuli over others. <coughs> now this has that quick connection to what I have been saying earlier, goals of the agent. Our goals are only goals as long as we know what to attend selectively to. We have no goals, forget about acting on goals, forget about generating a plan for an action, unless until we know how to attend selectively to such stimuli that will be relevant for us for that action. So Broadbent precisely said that 
out of all the stimuli that are bombarding themselves in the real world through all these senses that we have no control about. Constantly, they are getting bombarded. Our brain has the capacity to deal only with some. But he did not say how the brain even knows on which to act and how to avoid the other distractors. That question we are addressing now differently. So Broadband's model was simple. He called there was an early phase where all kinds of information come in and there is a filtering phase. In the filtering phase, you only attend to something that is relevant for that goal. Again, the conceptualization of a task, goal, task, schema, the agent's awareness of that task was critical to broadband as it was critical to modelers of memory. You can see a parallelism now. If you look into the history of cognitive psychology and, and how they were very similar in conceptualization. So it was very clear that attention is not just a matter of uh, attending so selectively, but we need to talk about what to attend. I consider apart from broadband, the most significant empirical breakthrough the technical breakthrough, the theoretically coherent breakthrough came with the work of Michael Posner. Michael Posner again divided attention into two components and said there are two types of attention, endogenous and exogenous. Now this was a masterstroke. It totally, totally explained all our basic behavior and motivation that you can see across classes. What is endogenous, what is exogenous? Any of you have, so I will skip all this if you know. I'll just give some brief examples just to say what I have. Yeah, no, that's why I, I told you that if you, you know, this is incomprehensible or I'm speaking too fast, then you can just. So you can raise your hand. So endogenous and exogenous, it connects nicely to what I have been saying. Endogenous is one's own volitional will to act on a stimuli in a decisive manner. And all of you are understanding what I mean by decisive manner. I take responsibility. I move this cube, uh, this from this place to another place. So, so I, as an agent, did it. Nobody told me to do that because I felt like because I have my own understanding of this task. So, endogenous component of attention, or what has recently been also termed otherwise by another researcher, I mean, Jun, a student of Posner, internal attention, and it makes perfect sense to me. So, endogenous or internal attention is one's ability to focus on a task till the end, till the goals are achieved in a voluntary focused manner and these are not given by outside agents. So endogenous component of attention I consider is very critical for cognition. How Posner studied into endogenous attention? Posner studied endogenous attention with a simple paradigm called a queuing paradigm. And all of you know these tasks called ANT, attention networking task, they use a simple queuing paradigm which has its own problems, though I agree. But that is the only way to study endogenous component of attention. Symbolically asking someone to orient attention and do some action. So that was endogenous. So why endogenous is important? Because it connects straight away to will, volition, action. If the person doesn't have endogenous internal attention, all would be exogenous, all would be external. There would, no, there would not be any involvement of working memory. It connects to well, what I have said half an hour ago. You can only use working memory if you have a good brain. Only if you have internal attention or endogenous attention or, or if the task requires such attention. Otherwise, there is no need to engage uh, working memory. You can be fine without that if most things are taken care of. So the other component was exogenous. According to uh, uh, Posner, exogenous is when stimuli catches summons our attention, calls our attention, and we get engaged with the world. There is a flicker, or there is a sound, or there is somebody, or there is a face, or there is a novel incident, or there is something, it takes me there. And unwillingly, involuntarily, I go there, I get engaged. And this is very important to understand. All the time we talk about attention deficit disorder, we talk about this and that. We talk about children not able to sit quietly and look, you know, because they don't have internal endogenous attention. Even if they have, they have a little bit of that. They cannot extend it over time. They cannot carry it forward. I talk, I can give a long lecture on the brain components that support this, but I guess there is no time for that. But just I am making some theoretical distinction so that you can find connections in your own work. I leave it to you. 
So exogenous attention is external attention and it is very important. By the way, suppose I go to a train station and I want to catch train and I will tell that I am attending to myself internally. I will say that I will only look whenever I want. Fine. But you will miss the train. If you don't hear the... <sighs> So that's external stimuli, that's not controlled by you. So you should hook up and say, okay, platform number 10, you should go and act. So external attention, orienting to stimuli, that is of your current need, is very critical. So exogenous attention is very critical as well as internal attention. So what I am trying basically to say is that people that have a right mix of both do very well cognitively. How it comes and how it manifests in various tasks is a long, long debate. So how you can study external and in, uh, internal attention? You can study with simple tasks like a queuing task or a, or some other cognitive psychological task but that will tell you the person's ability to engage voluntarily and the person's ability to engage involuntarily and also the person's ability to disengage voluntarily. That's very important. And this was also another contribution of Posner who said. Getting, at, getting attracted to a queue is not a big deal. All of us will go there. But can we come back to our own internal state so that we can attend to what we need to do rather than keep engaged? And this is the trouble. So executive control as a framework evolved with this. Executive control allows us to come back from the clutches of external attention, clutches of queues that are very, very strong. And today's world is full of this strong visual, auditory, exogenous cues. That is why we see so much of distraction, we see so much of trouble, not just on tasks, on everyday cognitive life. So the world is full of cues because it's a commercial world. People that are producing these cues have commercial vested interest. I do not think whether humanity needs it. But definitely, we keep enjoying this. There is a new mobile phone with nice glittering apps i keep looking at it but it was given by someone else my brain has not produced it and he has told me what do i benefit if i keep engaged with that for a while by the time the next model comes with another five apps so all i'm trying to say is that the very distinction of exogenous endogenous and coming back from the pool by the use of executive control is very critical in understanding basic cognitive processes that are essential for optimal performance on men's most tasks and you can find many many examples of such tasks you ask somebody to read a paragraph and tell you you use comprehension tasks you use listening comprehension tasks you use reading comprehension tasks you ask someone to memorize a list of words so all these activities are only possible if the person is not distracted and you have a check on him don't look there don't look, let not the mother sit in the therapy room let not the other sit in the therapy room. What are you trying to do? You are trying to minimize exogenous cues. However, how can you be sure that he has pulled out from the exogenous cues? So once incapacity to pull out from the exogenous cues, even when the cue is absent, is a trouble. Some children would keep looking. The mother was there, mother has gone. You have sent her off, but she was there. So throughout the whole time, he keeps looking at the pattern place because he cannot disengage voluntarily. No, it's a big question. How you train someone for internal uh, internal attention, for voluntary control of attention. But there are some, I would not name them, there are some commercially available programs. There are some techniques now. A lot of research articles today come out in the market and tell that if you train your brain on this and that task, they help you. And I would not say whether that good or bad, as a research analyst, I like, verify uh, or I understand them. But I think there must be something definitely. What is apparent is some causality. Something definitely is happening. Otherwise, uh, a lot of people would not say that they have benefited. So theoretically, these are the things about attention. <coughs> and I talked about memory. So I think these are the basic uh, uh, things that one must know. And how to diagnose and how to test somebody for attention. This is a matter of, uh, matter of uh, uh, practical everyday usage and uh, epidemiological uh, statistical issues. Uh, because uh, there are certain tasks and I guess all of you are aware of these tasks but the uh, thing is that uh, you know doing long term longitudinal studies are very critical and we do not have such data from India and that totally affects our 
how conceptualization. Though we have data from say, I got, I, you know, you look at the hospital record and you can come up with various scores, but uh, you know, you cannot be sure whether you can come up with a theory. So that that can guide the further researchers or further people. So we need all these kinds of longitudinal tasks. So attention and memory today are not visualized, by the way, as independent entities. They are visualized together. Working memory, particularly, is today believed to be nothing but selective attention. And all of you may know what is selectively attending to something as opposed to other forms of attention. There are two types of possible attentions. One is to have a dispersed attention throughout the visual field, and one is to selectively attend to one entity and not to many. Many people today are saying that selective attention is bad. If you attend selectively and too selectively, you are not doing well. So you should look more dis like, you know, when you zoom uh, out, out focus. So if you have a dispersed vision and you are attending to too many, not too critically, but a lot of them, then you may be performing better. I sometimes think of a traffic police. We're standing, a lot of visual cues are there. Suppose his job is to catch people, you know, that are this and that. At the same time, many people are committing crimes. It's not one is committing, then there is a gap and another is coming in. There is no serial processing there. So what does he do? So maybe he has to maintain what, what is called an alertness, all from, and which is not to selectively attend to one car or its number plate. Then he has gone, two other people are passed. He gets less money that day. So he has to be very, very attentive throughout. That maintenance of attention in a dispersed state and not selectively attending is the newest theorization. So while it is important to talk about endogenous and exogenous, it is also important to talk about how dynamically you can maintain a state so that you are having a surveillance that is helping you throughout the task and not that you have selectively attended. Selective attention is necessary in certain situations. Suppose I am trying to draw a tree, I have to selectively attend to that particular tree and not to the whole forest. So selective attention is also important. But on everyday situations we see, it can have a negative impact. Suppose there is a class and I am trying to address, I cannot just talk to one person. I cannot just look at a child who is doing mischief. I have to have a global spread of attention. Interestingly, our brain evolutionarily has come a long way with regard to attentional networks also. Because you have to look our history. We came from foragers. We were hunting. Our forefathers were cavemen. So stimuli was of critical importance. Anything could happen anytime. Right now we put animals in the, in, the, in parks and zoos, but that time animals were not in parks and zoos. They had to be totally aware all the time. That alertness over a period of time has helped us to be good foragers. There are many such things that evolutionary data can tell and reveal about the brain's ability to adjust to increasing complexity in the visual world. Because today's visual world is massively complex. The moment you do not have a vigilance or you are struggling to attend to multiple cues at the same time and do justice, you are in trouble. So what I'm trying to say is that some of these things uh, can come in into theory and therapy. So that we look at the client in a in a more holistic way rather than trying to uh, go with the world way. A new conceptualization of attention has also come up, which is called effortless attention. This is an antithesis to the whole framework of attention itself. Effortless attention means you are not attending but attending. And this has an echo with the Indian theory of mind. Our yogic meditative practices. I'm not getting into that, but there's a lot of research on the usefulness of meditation, on the usefulness of certain techniques. And I think many of them are recommended as well for improving attention. So what is this effortless attention? It's a bit like the example of the traffic police I gave. While he's trying to maintain a dispersed view of the visual field, and he can only be uh, attentive to certain uh, fluctuations that are part of his task set. Because if he has said, I will catch people who do not have this particular uh, sign on their car. So this is a task set he is maintaining. So he is uh, going straight to such cars or such uh, bikes uh, that deviate from this task set. This is an internal task set and he is not uh, specifically looking to particular. Because at one time you can see if you stand there on a traffic post, you can see that at one time he is 
able to prove his wisdom to multiple uh, cues. And this can only happen if he is maintaining uh, a dispersed, a relaxed, effortless uh, a state of attention. The important point here is to uh, link effortlessness with growing expertise. No doubt that expertise totally alters your brain. And I mean expertise of anything. I'm not just talking about expertise in speaking or writing or uh, doing something. I mean expertise in anything. Anyone who practices and practices and practices and hones his skill, he also changes his brain remarkably. And this is a fact, neuroscientific fact today. So any skill that is done over a period of time totally, totally alters your brain. And that is what we call effortlessness with regard to action. Because it totally affects the way you attend to certain things, right? Now, practically what can be... On, uh, yes. When mentioning about dispersed attention and focus attention. Evaluationally, which pattern of attention is natural to the being? And which one gets conditioned through life experience? Yeah. I think it was uh, in the beginning it was uh, it was dispersed because there were many possibilities because at the time some snakes had not come up that were staying on the trees because these evolutions happened uh, much later at that time there were some fish or some animals that were on the land sometimes and you know they could just disappear so as humans were learning more about their habitat they had to be more observant about the whole uh, territory uh, and we see a lot of that ability development as yeah. soon as the child is born yeah. and growing which one begins this? see uh, there is uh, there is not much study with regard to children and infants but some studies have shown that children learn to selectively attend to cues that are relevant to them only after a while because in the beginning in language learning all of you know any cue can attract attention it's only through systematic the frequency, the brain is tuned to frequency, which is the higher frequency of one cue over other, that forms the necessary neuronal networks and they recognize this stimuli over a period of time. So selectivity turns into effortlessness. So you call that is native language, that is native. It is a matter of frequency. So evolutionarily, both uh, endogenous, exogenous, selective, non-selective forms of attentions are given a period of time. And it also has something to do with the rapid and systematic development of the frontal lobe and the networks that we see today. Because it is important to note that the brain networks that support attentional engagement, disengagement, the frontal and the parietal area, these networks were not there before because the stimuli were less complex. The demands on the mental life were less. So as the demands went up, the stimuli became more unpredictive. Unpredictive. And as complexity in the environment, attention has to do with environment. And I mean, environment is the whole thing that is away from me, right? So all things started changing. So studies uh, with the diseased, uh, with, uh, with, with, with uh, both the new amazing uh, techniques and other postmodern studies of uh, brains are so uh, Many of the attentional networks, uh, you know, well, let's not go to the dissociation I was trying to avoid. Uh, so, yeah, more or less, this is the point that I'm trying to I, I hope that you have some sense. So, when you're trying to attend to a client, when you're trying to take uh, some tests, so when you're trying to look at a particular disorder, so how accurate you are in your observations of the basic cognitive skills that are attention and memory, and what are you trying to guess that some of these things may be deficient? Because nobody is going to report. No father and mother is going to tell you, look at three, uh, uh, two of your two age, uh, and uh, I did not know that his working memory was less because then I tell you he was speaking 40 words. That's all the data you get. So all I'm trying to understand is that there must be a systematic exploration of these various skills so that they are linked causally or they are predictors to the phenomena that is of your interest. Not necessarily those various things. But you may be getting presents that are hyperactive. There are no language trouble. People that have uh, autism, that have, that have affective issues, that have trouble with emotional issues, all these kinds of things are there. So I think attention and, uh, and memory are critical and uh, and they evolve over time. It's important to understand, with geriatric cases, they go down over time. So the 68-year-old man and a 20-year-old man and a 10-year-old boy, you cannot administer the same tests and come up with the same uh, you know, most of the time, though we do, because we cannot have, but this is a trouble because they need to have their own diagnosis.
Uh, so that is all about the second part. And the third part, I would like to live with speech and uh, the language disorder. How, uh, even if you know all the books and all the theorists from the brain sciences and the cognitive sciences or what are you going to do with them? Most people ask. I have a lot of studies with different kind of people with uh, illiterates and bilinguals and uh, all kinds of people. And they ask me, okay, you found out about the illiterate brain. This is what they do. As of, uh, I know. As well, how are you going to help them? Can there be a method? to train them on literacy skill faster. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of water, I think. So I can take a, any comment or any question if they have. On these classifications that I was trying to make. <laughs>